Beep boop, intro music. Welcome to Cypher Sci-Fi, we explore how and why. I'm Christopher Peterson. I'm Lee Colbert. We watched a movie. We watched uh, an indie movie that no one seems to have heard of, unfortunately. We did. I had never heard of it until Chris brought it up. It was pretty sweet. I'm glad we found it, and I hope to share it with everybody. It was The Osiris Child, Science Fiction, Volume 1. It's quite a title. Yes, it is. Released in 2016 and directed by Shane Abbas. I would say Abbas. Abbas. Shane Abbas. And starring a bunch of Australian actors that I don't know. So before the spoiler, I just want to let everybody know that we found this pretty sweet indie movie. This this cool indie science fiction project that I feel like had no exposure somehow. Yeah, where, where did you hear about it from? The internet? I don't remember. It was the internet. <laughs> it's pretty broad. <laughs> I wish I had someone to give credit to, but I don't. I stumbled across it somewhere. And now we're on the show. So but before we give like the synopsis spoiler deal, just consider seeking out this movie. It's online. You know, you can get it on Amazon streaming or whatnot. Actually, how do you get this movie? It's on YouTube, Google Play, iTunes, Amazon Video, and Vudu. Yeah. This wasn't like high art. It was just a really fun sci-fi action throwback. And uh, that's all I got to say about that, except for, spoiler alert, I'm going to spoil the movie. Spoiler alert, I'm going to spoil, spoiler alert, we're going to spoil the movie. <laughs> <laughs> multiple multiple warnings what is Os- what is science fiction volume one the osiris child about you sure it's not the other way around well it's the title is presented both ways depending on where you see it in the movie itself in the title card it was the science or sh- in the title card, it was Science Fiction Volume 1, The Osiris Child. This is all very important information here. Well, it's just, it's really funny. It's like a really presumptive thing to title your movie. like The History of the World Part 1? Yeah, like, well, no. It's like all that other science fiction, it was all practice. And now, Volume 1 starts right here with a hope for Volume 2 to come, I imagine. What's it about? It's a good question. <laughs> uh, let's see. An evil corporation using slave labor to expand out into space, but that's not good enough. So they make them into these weird <laughs> turtle things. And they, make, they run amok, yeah. and they blow up a reactor, and most everyone dies. The end. And some dude's trying to save his daughter. Yes. Get off my plane. <laughs> I don't know why. I don't know why. <laughs> it, it's not Harrison Ford. I don't know why I said that. It seemed like the I mean, reason. he fly, He pilots a plane. He is. Yeah, he's a pilot. Uh, yeah, that's about it. It's a, it's a very... B movie sort of sci fi epic callback thing. Yeah, it's in a bit 80s retro. B movie. It's it really harkens back to yesteryear, like story wise. It's kind of cheese ball. I'm not actually sure if they did that on purpose, but it's like it's remarkable what they accomplished with an indie budget. Oh, it looks great. It doesn't look like an indie movie. Oh, like and you would VFX expect wise, that I'm with you. It looks great. But the story is right there with what you would expect. Weird. Camp. Turtle. It's sort of thing. camp. Yeah. Yeah, it occupies this weird space between Camp and Sirius that I really enjoyed, actually. And like you said, the VFX were actually really, really good. And this is the classicest of the sci-fi themes where corporations are evil is the main driver. Nice to see that that's still here. Well, yeah, the man's still holding you down. It's timeless, apparently. It is. Corporations being evil and soulless. It's notable that this movie is going for something very large, sci-fi space epic. It's trying to build, it's trying to start building a universe. And that's Pretty cool thing to do with so little money and to pull off so well. Sure. One of the first things we see is a floating military base. Or, oh, actually, a floating corporate base. It, there's Cloud City. Literally, it's in the clouds. And it's a floating base. City. It's Cloud City, yeah. Kinda. Has anyone ever satisfactorily, even a little bit, explained how that sort of thing might work? Oh, I have one, actually. Like Venus. Venus? With jinx. Balloon. Venus jinx. Well, what's the deal with that? Remind us. Atmosphere, density, air, floats. Fewest yeah. words possible. Yeah, so the surface of Venus is just gross. You don't want to be there. No, unless you like burning and melting. <laughs> and being squished under like 10 atmospheres. We actually talked about the last time this came up for whatever reason. Talking with Fraser Kane. With Fraser. And then he went into many more words about exactly why. There are better words, but we're going to talk about it a little bit. Venus is gross and terrible, so the idea that you could settle the surface, that's actually way too difficult, but Venus is pretty close to the sun, 
Like there's a whole bunch of solar energy waiting to be collected and used. And if only we could be above the surface where it's deadly and be in a spot in the atmosphere where it's less dense, maybe even Earth-ish. And there's, that's the idea, is to put cloud city or to put floating cities there, like fill a balloon with Earth atmosphere. And then live in it. Yeah. Yep. Because the da- the atmosphere on Venus is so dense that living in the balloon, li- just normal ass Earth atmosphere is light enough to float within the atmosphere of Venus at a height that is not terrible anymore. You think you get a hamster ball and run around? That's basically what we're talking about. That'd be really, really, <laughs> I would not enjoy that. The bonus of this whole thing, too, is that the the percentage of Earth's gravity is like, it might be like 90%, which is pretty cool. <laughs> but if you float high enough, it's funny. You think of a cloud city as being like, you are a city floating amongst the clouds and it's open and free. But what we're talking about with Venus is you are in a bubble in the clouds and it's not open and free because it's all death out there. Although at that height, I think the composition is in, actually was actually not that bad. No, but it's still not hospitable. Still not hospitable, yeah. It would be... Uh, acidic and irritating. Again, you go outside in your hamster ball and run around. Yeah, as long as it was filled with earth, earth level atmosphere. Wouldn't that be fun? It's like, I'm no, going to go on a no, hamster wouldn't. ball walk. Why not? Okay. <laughs> you get a puncture. Hey, hey, now I get to go into burning soup. Well, yeah. What are you going to get punctured on? You're in a cloud. I don't know. I don't want to go into a plastic ball. <laughs> that's the only thing I survive on. But that's not uh, not what we have here, it would appear. No, this is very hospitable. It's Earth-like, just deserty. Yeah. We don't know how that thing, the city, the the base, is held aloft. No, but we have interstellar travel. See? <laughs> so I imagine we have some form of advanced technology. You, Maybe it's... I didn't see anything. It could be tethered to a counterweight out in space. Oh, wow. Yeah. I'd have preferred that you didn't just go, but like there's future technology, so whatever. Because then there's no... <laughs> Sorry, I had waved it <laughs> so thoroughly. But no, no clear indication given. A lot of the city is actually hidden in the cloud, or clouds. Oh, from our view, you mean? Yes. You yeah. You're not given an in-depth view, so I don't think it's very important. So hand wave, and then tether and in space. <laughs> I love the tether in space idea. We didn't see the the micro-thin carbon weave cord that might have been holding it or whatever, but that's a good idea. <laughs> so I think it was super advances in material <laughs> uh, technology there. Obviously. No, I was thinking it was a, a floating city, which, yeah, you're, the energy requirements would be number one for yeah, like I'm why try, that's crazy, I was crazy, trying to think right? of something that wasn't a just continuous drain of energy. I was thinking about the wording on this earlier, too. I was thinking about, you're aware that we've had a couple, literally, I think, two, floating aircraft carriers, and I'm putting quotes up because they're entirely unimpressive in the realm of aircraft carriers. You may not have been aware from your face. We have a ton of them. They float in water. Well, that was the thing yeah, I realized about the wording. When I was, t- I wrote in the notes, floating base, and I'm talking about floating, but yeah, they float in water already. Yeah. We should remember to think about it that way, though. Like, that's what the the Venus thing is, too, right? We'd be floating the city in a fluid, basically. It would just be, you know, the dense atmosphere instead of the liquid ocean that we have on Earth. This is seeming to be a normal atmosphere? It does. Seemed to be a normal or Earthish atmosphere. No one seemed and like they it had didn't to, seem like it was a giant zeppelin. Yeah, they didn't just, have to take special measures. But that's that's the difference. Is the couple times in the past that we've tried to have a floating aircraft carrier again with quotes because they're not that big. It was it was basically a zeppelin. It was lighter than aircraft that had like hanging docks underneath to which the plane could hook and the pilot could climb up out. So that's that's a cool idea, I guess. But they never worked out and like. They, I think both of them were destroyed in storms. Like, not even from war stuff, from, like, lightning and wind. Although they may be coming back. How's that? I've seen talk about having, well, for having long-term operations or having... Uh, you mean floating aircraft carriers, or you mean just mean lighter than aircraft in general? Lighter than aircraft, making a comeback. Like refueling stations or supply stations, stuff like that, at remote locations. You can fly it out and... It, no, it's just extending a logistics chains. And then if you tie it in with aircraft and drones and stuff like that, you can have stuff to loiter for like a month. Because if you aloft it with a you know lighter than aircraft, it can kind of stay there without a lot of continued energy input because it was all up front. Yeah, right. You just as once you put the helium there, it's lighter than air and it's going to float as long as you leave it in place. That's the bonus because it turns out that it would take like hundreds to make even a smaller class aircraft carrier be airborne. Just to make something of that scale, roughly, be airborne, 
it would take such a take such an absurd number of engines and an absurd amount of energy to keep aloft that it just it really doesn't make any sense without some sort of sci fi level energy breakthrough, energy and mechanics breakthrough, which is too bad because they always look so cool, i.e. Sky Captain or Avengers. And ultimately, those couple that we've had that were just basically dirigibles with hooks on the bottom didn't work out well. And they were tiny. We're talking about like half a dozen aircraft, maybe, as opposed to like 80 or 90 that we fit on a larger aircraft carrier in real life now. So you can see how the floating in water ones do a little better than the floating in air ones generally. Unless you have different goals for them. I mean, for now, for having loiter time for looking for people or information warfare makes sense, but... But that's not an aircraft carrier. Yeah, those yeah. are a force projection, and you want a lot of stuff to be able to go somewhere. Oh, would that be the term of art for that? Force projection? Yes. Meaning? You're able to project force <laughs> <laughs> elsewhere. No, uh, you have a sphere of uh, interdiction, I guess is what you call it. So you can move an aircraft carrier group out overseas, and now you have a lot of power right there with a short response time. You're saying it would just be another another craft for extending that range? No. no, I was saying like a dirigible that has it has a different purpose. It's not to project power like that, but you could use it for information gathering or information warfare. Oh, oh got it. But it's an impressive cloud city, and it looks pretty good. It's roomy. I mean, that dude had a quite nice room in there. Yeah. So our main protagonist is the guy who has a daughter who's going to save his daughter. I don't know his name. Doesn't matter. Hero dude. <laughs> Hero dude. He had a personal conversational assistant thing in his room also that I thought was pretty neat. It was like a, he had like a Jarvis or or, I should, or just like an Alexa, basically. Yeah, with a, a slight attitude. I like that it had that though. And I wonder, I always want to read more into this sort of thing in a movie than we should, I think, because I'm looking forward to that better, more intelligent, artificial intelligence. It's getting there. But the thing is though, like that's basically a chatbot. If we think about it the right way, that that personal assistant that I also have on my phone at this point, pretty much, is is a chatbot. And as much as there's like AI stuff involved in the building of that tool, it really does not at all require artificial intelligence to to operate in a satisfying manner. Although unfortunately. now we have AI building AI, so there you go. I'm trying to make that distinction between like when we say artificial intelligence in the popular culture and imagine like a computer that is sentient. And has a brain that can talk to us, as opposed to in computing, where we mean like we have collections of machine alg learning algorithms and tools, and you know enough data to crunch that we produce a very impressive and believable tool on the front end that ultimately is not artificially intelligent in any way that a normal person would expect that to mean. It's not sentient, no, or any other characteristic of possessing consciousness. But still, these tools. I don't think people realize how far we've come. With this sort of thing. Because it's been, it's exponential and it's all behind the scenes. So anyway, there's a, there's a base, I guess. It has people and technology and. And it floats in the sky. And it's at another planet. This is a corporate, a corporate project. It looks like as much as they have like a military structure and a hierarchy and uniforms, it was a corporate project. It's like Disney having its own army, basically. It's not far fetched. Or Space Navy, I should say. And they could probably afford it at this point. Yeah. Come work off world at Disney. Yeah. Space explorations. It's going to be interesting to see how that shakes out. Like what role the the public and private sectors will have ultimately and to what and in what mixture and how that's all going to shake out. Large. I mean, we are we're seeing it now. We always like to talk about it. Rich people with visions. I mean, making rockets to go to space. Absolutely. Yeah. Like we just had a Blade Runner episode last week. Blade Runner 2049. And in that film, spoiler alert, not really, humanity, because it's the same as the first one, humanity had been on other planets. Multiple other planets. And it was, it appeared to be basically private enterprise that had done this. Well, there wasn't so much of a, so much government anymore at that time, or in that universe, diegetically speaking. Well, it's hard to tell. Is it there an analogy? Much more corporatist. Corporatist, yeah. Which I guess that makes it different from like the, or, or at least my picture, the common picture of like the Westbrook expansion. Because this analogy comes up now and again on the show. The Wild West as an analogy for space settlement, that is. this this The Westbrook expansion as an analogy for spreading amongst the stars. Except a little harder. Harder, sure, but... Hmm. You need a lot more capital this time. 
to, to go westward into space. That's why it's just the scale of the operation seems to require government to be involved. Sure. At least at this point. Either that or just people with government-like levels of money. And also when we're looking at a universe like the one in the movie and there are corporate planet projects where it's just there's no suggestion of anything outside the corporation here that suggests like maybe that's how mundane it is you know like a corporation go by an island that's doable that's at the scale that makes sense maybe that's how that is in this world maybe that's how big a deal it is to have a planet station which is cool i like that's good for humans he even at one point in the movie the the hero protagonist dude that's actually the guy's name from that's confusing. Yeah, I was gonna say all you really need is for a private corporation to develop the FTL. Oh yeah. And if we're and talking about FTL. Go. Either they're the people selling the shovel for the gold rush, or they just control everything. <laughs> yeah. One step further, they yeah. are everything now. And did the guy the, the hero did say at one point that he was as far away as possible from Earth. We don't know how far that is. But he was talking about it like it's possible to go back. He got here within his lifetime, you know, within years or whatever. Yeah. They call it the flotilla. So apparently a number of ships all travel at the same time. Yeah, you know? maybe that. Or was it, was it just being clever? Because flotilla? No, no. Floated? It's actually referencing, if, if they're using the same terminology, it's a collection of vessels. Oh, yes. No doubt. That's what the word means in real life. I just never saw another one. So I'm not sure. In the movie. I never saw another one. Well, I think it's the whole idea that when you get into space, you harken back to naval days. The terminology in the larger ships. It does seem like the most appropriate analogy. That's going to be another thing to watch, to be interesting to watch it, like, form. How we talk about and imagine things in those dimensions. But basically, the Navy analogy seems to make the most sense with what we have on hand. And here's another point where it breaks with the Westward expansion, I guess, is the, the, the thing the corporation is doing here is running a prison colony. This is basically Australia. In fact, it is Australia, because that's where they filmed it and that's who made it, Australians. If I knew more about Australian history, I might understand even more of an analogy about what's going on here. But basically, this With is a prison, prison colony. Colony being the labor, yeah, for the inhospitable planet. We keep seeing this thing though, where space expansion it necessitates, or at least in the universe, it seems to necessitate slavery. Like there's no way to expand at the speed and rate and breadth that we want because we don't have robots that we trust without putting people to work that way that are cheap enough. Or people don't want to go live hard lives, possibly. That could be a hard sell. Like, the the dangers of living on the frontier in the West, except a bajillion times worse. It all depends on how crappy Earth is at the time, right? Because that always seems to be one of the selling points is get away from overcrowded Earth. Uh, That's all polluted, too, in this fresh new land. However, if Earth isn't like that... Then why would you go anywhere? Yeah. So you have to get back to the age of people that want to explore. And as much as you'd hope humanity wouldn't would not permit like slave labor colonies basically because it was called a prison colony for like rehabilitation but in practice it was slave labor to to I, i'm not even sure what they were doing mining resources from the planet so whatever whatever yeah, yeah just labor whatever labor is needed to make space work hmm. i would hope that humanity wouldn't allow that to happen but the corporations the, are evil man and we've seen private prisons it's not an unrealistic thing and now take away all oversight, put them on another planet. Imagine the perverse incentive systems that could grow up out of that situation. And also, you're right, with the with the remoteness and inaccessibility of far-reaching space colonies, like it might get ugly and be very difficult to control the incentive systems that breed this sort of behavior. Yeah. And it was evil. And it was an evil corporation. Because in the movie, they, we see that there were probably bad people there, but people were put there who did not need to be spending their lives in slave labor. Oh, no, absolutely not. <laughs> in fact, I, I, it might be possible the number of people who need to do that is zero, and any of this at all is bad. Mandatory minimum off-world slave S- colony. Sp- <laughs> <laughs> I really, I hope we don't need to have slave labor to do space expansion. I hope we don't need slave labor, period. Let's, I, yeah. let's, let's go that extra step. Like, I really, this, I could see, this this sort of like B-movie throwback thing that we have going on, it makes sense that we would be there. Sure. I, I think it's one of the easiest ways to paint a corporation as evil is you give it something. A space corporation. With, or any corporation. <laughs> Just the, It's like an easy line in the sand. It's setting up a clear malfeasance. Yeah. 
Uh, I just hope that we can do the robot thing instead because it is dangerous and it is hard. And if it comes to needing to enslave people to do it, I think we should enslave the robots. Just don't make them uh, sentient. Just, yeah, don't let the robots know that I said that when they come to take us over. Anyway, the, they are in the prison colony. Uh, the corporation is here at the planet. They operate from the station above, but they are the bosses of the station, of the prison colony. Literally high above everyone else. Mm-hmm. Unreachable. There is a nefarious, of course, because corporate The hoi evil. polloi up in the clouds. The corporation's evil, of course, so there is a secret project. A secret, illegal, oh, terrible yes, project. Slave labor is not just good enough. We also need secret biological experiments because we need to kill things that we don't like. They're doing like backwards Moreau on this. They're taking the prisoners and modifying them to be monsters. Killing sorta. machines. Killing machine monsters. So that's like backwards because in Moreau, he was raising the animals to be like men. Trying to, yeah, uplift them from their baser natures or baser selves. The purpose of these creatures, as it was given to us, was that they would... They would clear out the indigenous life on a planet. The unwanted indigenous life. Unwanted. Although, how do you separate? It's just a a weird looking turtle thing with poison tongue. Yeah, well, if you didn't see the movie, if you're coming along for this ride and haven't actually watched the movie, they are, they're evil ninja turtles. Or, if you're familiar with the older Mario Brothers movie. I don't think we're in Brooklyn anymore. (laughs) They look like the Goombas, (laughs) just with worse clothing. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, like disheveled Goombas that have been living in the street for a while. Well, yeah, yeah, and with like liver spots, and they've been out in the sun too long. The design of this monster is confounding. Like for its purpose in world, I don't know what they were thinking. I don't know what's going on here. They're just these giant cumbersome Ninja Turtle creatures. Yes. Like, uh, that's it. Yeah. Like imagine the Ninja Turtles, but without ninja agility or and shells. more of a shuffle. Mm. But very capable, nonetheless. Somehow. They seem like that thing that you could just walk quickly away from. <laughs> but I guess slow and steady wins the race. The way they frame it, they are part of a terraforming... They're part of a terraforming project. Like, maybe... I'm not sure if they're using the word in a way that I understand. They're talking about using it in terraforming that... I think they're the going clear- for the broader sense of just making the overall biome more hospitable for sure. our life. Which, and then you have to, it's like, so then you put the cat to get the mouse, and you get the dog to get the cat, and then you get the something else to get the dog, like, and then all you lived in a shoe, and you don't know what to do anymore. We get, then we're going to get gorillas to kill the mongoose. <laughs> <laughs> no, I like where you're going with this. So that's, that's going to be a problem for sure. It's when you hear terraforming, you get, I'm not like weird on this, right? You're thinking literally terraforming. You're imagining there's something to do with the earth, not the earth, but the planetary surface itself. I also would tend to think larger scale, like you're seeding the planet with the germs and base life that you need, first off. Yeah. Should we still use that word when we're at a scale where it's like we're getting rid of the big monsters as opposed to making the ecology start? Because that's how they're using it. I thought that was strange. Like maybe there's another word for that. Maybe ecoforming. Like there's a thing there. It's just not quite right. And we want to set the ecology into a state that is more hospitable to humans. Although terraforming does include the, um, ecological manipulation. So. so that's still, does that seem fair? Okay. I'll take it if that's how we're using the word. Because what I was thinking was if you're... Yeah, this was very macro in scale. Yeah. Because it, it seemed. Cause it's it, like killing off wolves. I wouldn't call it, consider that terraforming, but I guess <laughs> if you want to be fast and loose with it. We terraformed New Jersey pretty good. Yeah. We don't have a lot of wolves left. Plenty of deer. The terraforming, though, it's... uh. If we think of it in the way that we both thought of it first, where we're talking about like this thing is not hospitable at all. Life could not be here. Let's make it so life could live that at that point, I guess you don't need these creatures. You don't need the the monsters to clear the land because everything, if anything was alive, changing the surface to be a completely different Im- environment that is hospitable to humans will probably kill all the things that are there. Yeah. So this seems to be more specifically bio manipulation. What is the removal of a specific a specific species okay or a creature or whatever selected ones are large enough to be an issue for us whatever yeah like this... getting getting rid of wolves specifically like a oh we're talking about wolves predator now. for spe- like if that made it in if you were to get rid of a spe- like a predator or something that's bio manipulation of an ecosystem oh okay so you suggest this is the word we should be using for that particular sort of practice this is what they seem to be wanting to do mm-hmm. yes yeah 
I love that, like, look at how careful NASA is when they head to Mars. Like, we super sterilize the craft, you know, and drop it on the planet and don't go near the stuff where we think there might be life because we don't want to ruin that ecology if there is anything. Such care. And, like, remember, oh, I remember the water when they thought there was water uh, dripping down the side of the hill. It turns out that probably not. But in any case, like, with that suspicion, the answer was don't go near it with a rover because we don't want to mess it up if there is life. Such care. And now here we are, we're like making murder machine monsters to eliminate the other apex. Evil corporation. There's a ton of planets. There's probably more life. We're fine. In a way, that sucks. But in another way, if we're in enough places that that like that's how we treat it, that's kind of cool. That it's that life, life is, is so abundant. It's yeah, a nuisance that you do, yeah, you're just trying to get rid of it because it's in your way. That sucks that you would do that sort of. But also on the other hand, if there's that much of it and it's that easy, that's pretty sweet. And then you have giant irradiation programs, sterilize the planet, and then reseed it. Why do that when you could drop a giant Ninja Turtle on it? <laughs> because I don't think <laughs> the Ninja Turtles are going to be eating all the, the, <laughs> the microbes that you don't want. These creatures, you go down there, and they're just like, pizza power, and they're not killing anything anymore. <laughs> Tubular. <laughs> they're just super chill skateboarding. Wouldn't that be incredible? <laughs> if you're Again, if you're here and you didn't see the movie, you're like, you must be so confused. I'm sorry. This is the danger of picking a film that no one has seen yet and trying to promote it, but someone might just listen without watching the film anyway. Radical. I already had a shower. Oh, that one. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so in summary, uh, <laughs> eco-forming. Yeah, this seems or, like an odd plan. Yeah, yeah. And, you, and they know that it's not okay for what it's worth. Some prisoners escape, and along the way, they let these monsters all loose on the planet. So that's actually the main thrust of the plot here is... Here are guys on the station. His daughter's on the planet. When those creatures are let loose by accident on the planet, he has to get down and save his daughter before the corporation like nukes it or whatever. Procedure 84 is it. That sounds ominous. Is that like rule 34? I hope not. Is that like, <laughs> That's a mean odd rule to have a space corporation. Is there a rule 34 for like space turtle monsters? Yes, there has to be. That's what rule 34 states. I actually lost track of this a little bit, the plot thing. Like, why are they blowing up the planet? Because the turtle things got out, and that's the best way, is to kill everything. Because you don't care. But these guys, they're actually, they seem like they really aren't a great predator. It's like, if there was a, a super virus got loose, and, you know, it was all over, and you can't see it, and you don't know how to fight it, you can't just burn it with fire, so super virus everywhere, like, maybe kill the planet, and then that won't spread? There was some kind of RRI projection where we could put guns in people's hands and send them down and exterminate them, or we could just... Blow up the planet. And we saw, they go down from bullets. Like, we see that happen. It actually would be cost effective, I think. I, it came, what I would eventually realize was that I think they are covering their tracks by trying to, like, make the planet an inhospitable wasteland. Yep. And say, oh no, there's a terrible accident. Everyone died. Yeah, don't Nothing go near there. Here. Don't look further. <laughs> don't look further. It's dangerous. And so that's the plan is, I got confused for a second. I thought they were going to nuke it and blow it up. But what they were saying was they wanted the, they wanted to ruin the planet by exploding the nuclear, nuclear reactors reactor. by melting them down, which I don't, I don't think that's how that works. The way they, they made it seem was it was going to blow up and destroy the planet. Their words, and maybe they meant ruin the planet, make it unhabitable because giant clouds of radiation. Like the way they were <laughs> describing it was giant explosion. We have to get to this bunker to be safe. It was a little confusing because ultimately that was not what happened, because that's not how meltdowns work. No, no. Typically, you don't make a reactor like a bomb. That would be a bad way to make your yes, reactor because it's very dangerous. A nuclear bomb <laughs> and a nuclear reactor are designed differently. Surprise, surprise. I'm glad. First of all, there's the amount of like enriched radioactive material that you use. One is very, very high. The other, not so much. Like you get four or five percent enrichment in reactors. You have like 80, 90 percent in bombs. Oh, really? I didn't realize that. That's like the the purity of the radioactive materials. Yeah, and then you put like control rods or some kind of other um, what's the word moderator for the reactor, other so to slow down the amount of neutrons that are okay uh, given off. Okay, absorbed. so this is my understanding of how they work when they're not exploding or or melting down. Is like they it's just really like hot. any other power thing. It's make water hot, use steam to turn turbine, power plant. Yeah, you can use water. You can use air. There are different. There are different, different, uh, wow, 
there are different types of reactors. One of the other ones I've seen is called a pebble bed reactor that theoretically wouldn't explode if it went to a failure or just get hotter. Well, isn't that the problem, though, that makes the explosion? Well, yeah, the water builds up and you have a high amount of pressure versus the other are passively air cooled. So that it just gets hotter in the room and you can use an inert gas in the room. So, oh, OK, that sounds nice. Yeah. Because that was actually the problem with like Not Chernobyl. The risk of explosion. Yeah. The explosion, I had to look this up because I was like, reactors don't explode. I remember them exploding. What's the connection here? And it's that, it's not that they don't explode. It's just they don't explode like a nuclear bomb. Yeah. It's more like- Like an explosion. A pressure cooker exploding. Yeah. So I guess the thing where you have your nuclear reaction heating water into steam and turning the turbine, if that goes awry and there's a meltdown- the the explosion, like at Chernobyl, would be steam and metal reacting and exploding, which is still vastly different than like you let off a nuclear bomb. Still bad. Still bad because it still explodes a bunch of nuclear material, fallout type stuff in the air, oh, potentially. Yeah, and then you have radioactive lava at the site as well to deal with. Where the literal meltdown is occurring, right? Yes. And again, talking about Chernobyl, we have that like terrible haunting photograph of the elephant foot. I couldn't think of which body part it was, and I didn't want to start guessing. But yes, the elephant foot. And all this goes to say, too, that uh, we don't know what kind of reactor thing they have in the future when they have FTL. (laughs) So a little bit of hand-waving is we don't know how they might work, possibly. It's cool that they use nuclear reactors because they seem familiar, but who knows what technology is later on top of that that we have no idea. And then Ninja and Yolandi die. And the other hero that we didn't mention turns into a turtle, but a good one. And there's a fairy tale ending and they're going to Earth. The end. So that is quite different from most movies, is that the protagonist straight up gets murdered. Forgot to mention that, but yeah, that guy died. There's no boss battle or anything, <laughs> no like big just hey look, there's a gunship and we're on a bus and oh no, I was shot. <laughs> no, they took a bullet. I was surprised. Yeah. That's I, is that a brave decision in your film, right? Me and you, giant turtle monster, we're going to Earth. The end. What do we learn? I I was very <laughs> surprised by this indie movie, and I would be interested in seeing a sequel. Yeah, I learned that there was this movie that existed, and it was impressively fun and large for what it was. And also, yeah, the, the way that nuclear reactors have exploded in the past, because they didn't really understand. Also, I'd like to see more movies along like this, this vein. Which? Very well done indie movies. Yeah, ultimately that's another thing too. Is like I love to see, I love to see the indie succeed, and also there's, you know, you're gonna get a different voice from that sort of thing than you would from you know the larger players. So that's cool. Also Australia, good day, mate. Australian listeners, let me know how you feel about that. Australia, I don't know. Should I? Uh, Do as you wish. Colbert. Yep. Recommended related stuff. Did anything come up? What do we got? How about this cool movie that's available on like all the services? Nothing? We should probably recommend the Mario Brothers movie from the 80s. You know what? You can recommend it. <laughs> I wouldn't want to inflict that upon people. You know? No. <laughs> but no, you really got to look, go, go look at the show notes at least to see the, the incredible likeness between the Goombas of Mario Brothers in 1993 and the Ninja Turtle Monster dudes from this film from now. Yeah, that's... Either someone was heavily influenced or some cryptomnesia going on. Ah, cryptomnesia. My my specialty. Yeah, we're pretty good at it. <laughs> Everything that I say that's clever is a thing Colbert said earlier, and then I said it not remembering where it came from. That's Or I'm just gaslighting Chris, and I'm very good at it. <laughs> that might be, too. It's easy. Hey, Colbert. What's up? On the, on the note of, like, indie stuff, I'd like to say that you should support your creators on the internet, your independent media and creators... I love that we can do this now. Like, we're not in the same scale as this movie that cost some small number of millions, probably. But. Pretty close. Pretty close. (laughs) (laughs) There's only two of us here. Give us a break. We have some people online who are supporting us in the making of the show. Who are they? We got Joe Ferraro, Dean at LSG Media, Nicholas Little Boy Lowe, Daniel the Antlander, Robert, Captain of the SS Minnow, Jeremy, Jeremy Boberemy, Andy P. of Bash 25 Comics, Brian the Sexiest Brother Peterson, Peter Manley the Dutchman, Andrew Capitolo the Mighty, Jeff Farmer Schwarman, Chris Gunnard, Michael the Giantess Peterson, Samuel Mumby, Igor Smolinski, Eli Avron, Josh Effingy of LibertyStreetGeek.net. Thanks again for coming on, Josh. Curly Phil, 
our Kobe FF Joe Ruppel, Alaric Dirk and Gunarm Superhero, Daniel James Barker of Uncertainty Principle of the Podcast, AJ Falcone of this podcast sometimes, John, champion of photosynthetic beavers, DJ Space Bus Moffat. There's a bus in space on a planet. I mean, it was on a planet on a, <laughs> in space. DJ Motorboat Moffat. Space Motorboat. Boat, motorboat. motorboat. <laughs> or bus. Spus. So many options. Yeah. And my mom and Grandma Judy and evil corporate space unicorn Jolene Creighton. Oh, I thought you were going to go with uh, terraforming lizard unicorn. An evil corporate terraforming lizard unicorn Jolene Creighton. <laughs> <laughs> really rolls off the tongue. Thank you, everybody, for supporting the show. Especially with recent Patreon turmoil that turned out not to really be happening. Well, it hasn't changed, though. The CypherSciFi.com slash subscribe, which is where you would tell people to go that you think might like this. Yeah, you probably know people, right? You know people like you. You're a cool person. You're good enough. You're smart enough. And doggone it, people like you. They'll listen to your advice. What's our URL again? The CypherSciFi.com slash subscribe. Booyah. Yeah. I think that's the end of the show. I know it's it's iffy picking like this weird indie movie that had so low awareness. Um, I hope I hope this spurred someone to see this cool thing, and maybe those dollars will flow into encouraging more indie projects to happen. And that's the end of the show. It's a me, Mario. Let's kick shell. I think we nailed it. Where are we? We're so in sync that we don't just redo it. Look at that.